this evening. I want to continue our study we've been going through on Philippians. If you were with us this morning, you caught part one of two. This will be part two of two. So we're looking at servants of proven worth. So Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 25 through 30, we'll be focusing on Epaphroditus, but uh, the earlier verses there, uh, we covered Timothy. So we talked about these two men as servants of, of proven worth, or over the course of these two lessons, we'll have talked about both of these men. We talked about Timothy this morning, and as we continue, we'll uh, focus on Epaphroditus in the second half of this lesson. <clears throat> so if you want to turn with us to uh, Philippians chapter 2, we'll be reading actually through 19 through 30, so we'll catch that review of Timothy, and then we'll get into Epaphroditus, and as I said, we'll focus more on Epaphroditus this evening. So I'll be reading from the Legacy Standard Bible, if you'd like to follow along. Philippians 2, 19 through 30. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be in good spirits when I learn of your circumstances. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned about your circumstances. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel, like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately, as soon as, my, as, as, soon as I evaluate my own circumstances. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. Verse 25, we begin with Epaphroditus, but I regarded it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. My brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy, and hold men like him in high regard, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to fulfill what was lacking in your service to me. So, as we think about, <clears throat> about uh, Timothy here, we'll get into these points that, uh, that, that we looked at this morning, that he uh, was genuinely concerned for the, for the church there in Philippi, a man of, of character. He was seeking after the interests of, of Jesus as contrasted with some who were... Uh, self-seeking, selfishly interested, and those who were even uh, actively uh, trying to one-up Paul and to, to just uh, show off or something and to be better than Paul rather than having pure motives. But Timothy's not like that. He's, he's focused on the interests of Jesus Christ. And he was, of course, serving the advancement of the gospel. That's, as we've seen in this letter, that's Paul's mission. It's almost Paul's obsession of all about the gospel, to focus on the gospel and to share the good news with those in need of hearing it and transforming their lives. So, in the course of, of, of that, he, he's pointing out that he can't send Timothy now. He would like to, and, and they love him. They want to have Timothy come. But, and as we've talked about uh, some background of this letter, uh, Paul is facing, I believe, a trial before Caesar, and he's there in Rome. And so, since he's waiting for to see what's going to happen, he kind of needs Timothy there to support him. So, He's not going to send Timothy now, but he's sending Epaphroditus back, uh, who, who the Philippians had sent initially in the first place there. But Paul then hopes to come soon after with Timothy after the trial, ho hoping for that good outcome, uh, which of course we, we believe did occur, where he was able to um, be released from that particular trial, but then later on got into more trouble and was executed. So let's think about Epaphroditus as part two of this lesson, thinking about the background of Epaphroditus, and the reality is we don't really know a whole lot about Epaphroditus other than what we read here 
in Philippians. But the, the name itself, Epaphroditus, means something like charming or, or handsome from what I've studied. It's rooted or related to the uh, goddess Epaphrodite. There's a kind of see some similarity in the name there. And uh, Aphrodite was the goddess of love and, and beauty. And so with a name like that, you could surmise that he was likely a Gentile rooted in that culture. And notably, he didn't change his name after becoming a Christian. And we could also note that, you know, neither did Apollos uh, or Hermes or Olympus. We read about those two characters in uh, the greetings at the end of Romans. Apollos was that great preacher. <clears throat> and it seems to be a later practice that Christians would take a Christian name, change their name. But here at this early, early time, people, uh, their lives were transformed, but they didn't necessarily change their name. We know Jesus changed Peter's name, different examples like that. And we can also think, and maybe you've heard, or maybe your mind is going to, what about Epaphras? I know about Epaphras. Well, there is a, a character in the Bible named Epaphras, and that man was a different person. Uh, even though Epaphras and Epaphroditus in that culture were nicknames for one another, uh, we, like, we have other examples like Priscilla, sometimes called Prisca, and that's the same person. Uh, Sylvanus, and Silas, two names for the same person. Uh, this, this Epaphras that we're referring to is actually a man linked with the church in Colossae, and he seems to be very closely linked with that church there, and Epaphroditus is very closely linked to the church in, in Philippi. So it's most likely that these are two different individuals, even though their names could be interchanged. So we can't draw from, oh, let's look at Epaphras, because I think it's a different person. <clears throat> now, uh, in chapter 4 of Philippians, and, and really here in chapter 2 that we're studying, we see that the Philippians sent a gift uh, to Paul by means of Epaphroditus. They sent Epaphroditus. We can jump ahead to uh, Philippians chapter 4 and read a little bit about that, where he's uh, talking to the Philippians about their giving. And, and he says in Philippians 4.15, and you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church fellowshiped with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. So they were the only church that was supporting him financially, seems to be what he's saying there in that area. Verse 16, for even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more, more uh, than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek the fruit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have abundance. I have been filled, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. So we get from these, these verses we've just read that uh, Philippi, the church in Philippi, the Philippians have helped Paul numerous times uh, financially and, and, and sending Epaphras as an assistant as well. And he's trying to emphasize, I'm not bringing that up to say, hey, you know how you helped me? I could, you know. He's not hinting at wanting some more help. Uh, he's trying to make the point that that's not what he's saying. He has everything that he needs. Uh, and Epaphroditus brought the gift that they, that they had sent. And he describes it here in this verse, like a, uh, using language like a, a sacrifice, a, a holy, uh, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And that's true of whenever we're helping uh, good workers in need or, or those who are in need and honor God in that way. It's a, considered that similar idea of a, of, of a fragrant aroma, pleasing sacrifice to God. But here in uh, Philippians 2, 25 through 30, the verses we want to look at tonight, uh, Epaphroditus we're going to look at three ideas about Epaphroditus, that he is a minister to your needs, or, or to Paul's needs specifically. He's longing for you, longing for the Philippians, the idea there. And that he's uh, so involved in working for Christ, he's actually risking his life. And we see this reference to him being, being sick or ill or having some sort of health problem there. So let's think about ministering to your needs. Ministering has to do with being a servant, being a being of service to someone. So verse 25, we, we read there, but I regarded it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also 
uh, your messenger and minister to me. So he kind of stacks up a whole bunch of titles or uh, descriptors there about Epaphroditus. He calls him a, a brother, so a brother in Christ, but also a close friend, a family, someone he loves, this, this man, Epaphroditus. He calls him a fellow worker, talking about that they're both working to advance the gospel together, both sharing the gospel. That's what he's what he was there, not just to bring the gift, but apparently to keep working there with Paul to share the gospel. And a fellow soldier, kind of saying the same thing a different way, referring to the idea of us being in a spiritual warfare with the principalities and powers, but even just the idea to maybe to appeal to uh, the, the Roman soldiers. So we talked earlier about how uh, Philippi was a Roman colony, and it was sort of set up for a place for Roman soldiers to go and retire. Like maybe you're thinking about Florida or something in our, in our uh, United States, but, but specifically a place for soldiers to go and retire. So there's probably a, a higher than usual population of, of people with that soldier background. And so this language may have resonated with them, especially to call him a fellow soldier. And it's also a great praise for Epaphroditus. It's sort of like uh, Paul, if you think of Paul as the general, the great leader, and having this one of his captains, so to speak, Epaphroditus, and he's kind of putting him on equal footing. He's a fellow soldier with me. So giving him great praise and, and honor for the work he's doing. And this word translated as messenger here, uh, this word right here, messenger, it's actually the same word for apostle. I thought that was interesting. Um, not that, you know, uh, Epaphroditus is one of the 12 apostles or something like that. Not that he is an apostle in the sense that, that Paul is an apostle, but uh, in the sense that uh, Epaphroditus was charged by the church at Philippi with the mission to go and help Paul. So he's an apostle of, of the church of Philippi, whereas Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ. And we think about, of course, the 12 apostles in a similar way. So sometimes we maybe use a capital A apostle or little a, Apostle, or we just translate it messenger because that's too confusing. We don't want to uh, muddy the waters and, 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 and question what are we talking about here. But it's interesting that that is the same word. So we see that he's serving the needs of the, the church in Philippi, doing what they can't do because they're not there. And, and Philippians 2, verse 30, jumping a little ahead, talks about how he's doing the work of Christ, he's risking his life, and he's Fulfilling what is lacking in your service to me. So Paul talking to the Philippians, your service. You want to serve me, but you're not here. But Epaph Epaphroditus is here. and he's, he's serving me in ways that you can't do since you're absent. So he's served by uh, both Epaphroditus and Timothy, if we take this broader context. And these good men are, are helping and supporting Paul in the work of the gospel. So also, we can see that he's longing. There's this longing for you aspect where he's he's missing his uh, ch church family back home in Philippi. Verse 26, because he was longing for you, this is why I'm sending him back, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. And if you kind of follow the logic here, it's kind of a beautiful idea of love flowing both ways. You know, Epaphroditus was not well, uh, and the Philippians back home heard that he's not well, and so they were naturally upset. But then Epaphroditus heard that they heard that he's sick and that they're upset. And so now oh, we're all worried about each other worrying. And we, we don't want everyone to be upset. And so that seems to be what we're talking about here. Uh, he's, he's longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. So everyone's upset and, and that's, he wants to be home so that they can all uh, have a good reunion and, and not be sick anymore and, and sad. And we might ask, you know, what was this sickness? What was this illness he had? Uh, Literally, the, the word there could be a weakness or a disability. It's, it's really unclear what it is. We might think he had the bad flu or he had uh, some sort of injury, an accident, or maybe in the course of persecution. You know, he's risking his life for the cause of Christ and he has this health problem or maybe some kind of mental illness. Who knows? He had some kind of problem where he wasn't able to function. He, he was not well kind of speculating there. We don't know. Uh, but nevertheless, he had some kind of problem. But whatever happened to him, however he got sick, this all happened in the course of him risking his life. 
in the cause of Christ. So we see that verse 27 and onward here. So it says, For indeed he was sick to the point of death, very serious illness. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. So his health problem was so serious to the point that he nearly passed away from this. And there's no indication that Paul used his miraculous abilities to heal, interestingly enough, but God had mercy on Epaphroditus, it says here, in this healing, perhaps through natural intervention. We were all, God has mercy on us from time to time. Uh, very often he has mercy on us in our healing. But not just on Epaphroditus was this mercy, but also on Paul, because he would lose this beloved friend if he had passed away. And even uh, in a practical matter, this assistant who was helping him while he was constrained with uh, his imprisonment, ha having Epaphroditus to help with the ministry of the gospel was, was, was good and helpful and didn't want to lose that as well. He would have been great sorrow, sorrow upon sorrow. It's a very emphatic way to say it would have be, been horrible, horribly uh, sorry if he'd passed away. And of course, we feel the loss of loved ones deeply as well, um, especially family. We have that closeness and, and that deep tie there. But even those that we work with in secular jobs or in the church have these associations. And we're certainly thankful when, uh, when those we care about recover. And we've had even on our prayer list different things, different ones who have gotten better and some who still have some struggles. So Epaphroditus was sick, and he got better, but, but what now? What, what next here? Verse 28. Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned or less sorrowful, a similar wording as the previous verse there. So Paul sent him back, presumably Bearing this letter, this letter to the Philippians, he's coming back with, well, I've got the whole Bible here in my hand, but would have had just the, just the short letter bringing that to the church at Philippi for the first time. So the Philippians can see Epaphroditus again and not be sorrowful, kind of have this, this happy reunion. So, and then Epaphroditus wouldn't have to be sorrowful for their sorrow, this, this sort of cycle of sorrow. He's concerned that they're concerned and all of this. If they get back together, they can have this good reunion. Verse 29, receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard. So welcome him. We, I think that's the similar language we have at, uh, toward the beginning of Romans 14 and, and then into Romans 15. There's this book ends, receive, receive your weaker brother in that case. Uh, but here, receive this honorable worker. Welcome him and honor him, receive him. He is a model to emulate. He is a an example to follow and praise anyone who serves like him hold him in high regard and people like him well what's what's the big deal what's why is he such a big deal well verse 30 kind of points out well because he came close to death for the work of Christ risking his life to fulfill what was lacking in your service to me he nearly died in the course of, of his work there he risked his life in, in service uh, to God by serving Paul, by being essentially an apostle with a mission from the Philippian church, doing those, that good work. He was risking his life through the, uh, again, we don't know the nature of his illness, but we know there was persecution, and we know at different times Paul was stoned and, and Stephen was killed. We know that Christians uh, had a lot of risks going on, and so Epaphroditus was in the brunt of that fulfilling the mission of God. And one thing, kind of think about as an aside, it's different than our culture. A, a lot of cultures in the Middle East and, and in Asia have more of a focus on an honor-shame culture. And if we kind of think about uh, this whole situation with that lens that the folks in that area had and have, it may be instructive for us to think about. So there may have been a, a danger of misunderstanding or misperceiving what, uh, what the deal was with Epaphroditus. This uh, misunderstanding in a shameful way, like, like, like Epaphroditus had failed or something. 
So, that, so you might think through what the church at Philippi perhaps were thinking in this shame culture, uh, honor shame culture. You know, they might say, well, we sent Epaphroditus to help Paul, and that is an honor. We, we want to, uh, not that they're seeking self-honor, but it's just an honorable thing that they went to help Paul, and, it, and it's a great honor. But then Epaphroditus got sick. And it's kind of a dishonor. We kind of failed in our, you know, our effort. Was, we had an intention for him to be helped, but now it didn't go the way we helped. And that would be sort of a dishonor in that culture. And so certainly they care about Epaphroditus, but they're concerned that perhaps he's more of a, more of a burden than a blessing to Paul. That what they intended for him to take that gift and to help Paul. And now, uh, you know, he was supposed to be helping Paul, but now they're having, Paul's having to nurse him back to health. You know, maybe, well, what have we done? Our, our intentions have gone awry. You know, we have failed to deliver this great gift in a way that's helpful to Paul. We caused Paul and we caused Epaphroditus more trouble than help. You know, if we had just hadn't sent Epaphroditus, he could be safe at home and be well and not have had the trouble that he'd had. And, and we're uh, causing more trouble to Paul than we're helping. It would have been better to not have sent him. We're, we're so embarrassed, perhaps, is the thought that they might have. And, and then, uh, you know, having not yet received the letter that we're studying, they would see Epaphroditus coming home with, with the letter. And, and they would realize, well, Epaphroditus got better. And, and Paul must have agreed with us and, and put an end to this foolishness, sending him out. Get, get him out of here. He's no good. He's not helping me. Get this guy out of here. And we're so ashamed. That would be with their initial thoughts in that honor-shame culture. You know, we meant that this gift to be a blessing, but now Epaphroditus is returning in shame. It was a failure. But then they read the letter, the letter that Paul sent with Epaphroditus, as a, somewhat of, not an introduction letter, because of course uh, Epaphroditus is coming home, but a letter that part of which explains the situation with Epaphroditus, you know. It's a great honor then for Epaphroditus of what we've read in this, in this letter. He's a, a fellow worker and a fellow soldier, even putting him you know, on par with, with Paul as a soldier. He's a fellow soldier. He's not just a subordinate. He's a, co- a co-worker with him and uses that apostle language. You, know, he, you sent him on this mission to, to do this good work, to serve my needs, and you know, he, he did get sick. And we all loved him. And he was concerned for you, and I was concerned for him, and everyone's concerned for everybody because we all love each other. And God intervened and healed him, had mercy on all of us because we were all concerned about this. And so, and so I sent him back to you because I know you were concerned too. And then that verse 29 that we, we looked at, you know, receive him and welcome him with joy. Hold men like him in high regard. He is an example. He's not some kind of shame thing that perhaps in that culture they, they could have thought. He is a man of great honor a great example. And he, he wasn't a failure at all. He was a brave warrior for Christ. He risked his life and nearly died for the sake of Christ. And he did what you all couldn't do there in Philippi because he was here and you were not. You sent him and he did a great work. It was a great service. So, so if there was any of that shame culture, honor shame culture getting into their mind, thinking of those things, he, he diffused all of that and, and gave a great honor to Epaphroditus. And so, as we think about Epaphroditus, how he's a minister, he's a servant, has that good attitude of helping Paul, we should have that attitude as well, um, <clears throat> have that same attitude. And as he had that idea of longing for one another, especially as he was ill and, and away from home, we should have that same love for one another, that mutual love and care for each other. And as we think about him risking his life, as he was sharing the gospel and either fell ill or, or had some injuries, and we don't really explain what, what happened. His, his health was deteriorated by virtue of being out there. Um, what's a great honor that he, he served God in that way. He's a good servant of proven worth like Timothy. And that's who we've talked about, these two servants of proven worth, Timothy and Epaphroditus. So I'd leave you with uh, one verse just to keep in mind as we think about this lesson where Paul wrote about Epaphroditus. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard. So 
we too should serve God honorably and, and honor each other and recognizing the service one another does for God and honor each other, encourage each other and grow in the Lord. And certainly we should obey the Lord. And if there's anyone who hasn't obeyed the gospel, we have a, a time here where we certainly want to share the invitation. That This is what the letter is all about. It's Paul sharing the gospel, the good news. Jesus Christ is king. And every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, but will we do that here on earth in life and honor him and serve him in faith? Or will we kind of be forced to do that at judgment day, in which case our judgment is sealed in a negative way? So if anyone needs to uh, obey the gospel this evening, we'd encourage you uh, to do that. If you'd like to study together, if you need prayers or whatever it is, we're going to sing this song, and this will be an opportunity for you to come forward while we do that. We're going to sing, There's a Great Day Coming. Are you ready for that day?